This is a production of Cornell University. Just wanted to start out right away by um, thanking my lab group and the, the funding source for the, um, the information I'm going to be sharing with you today. So um, right now in my lab, I have Ruth Gender, who runs a, a program for organic farmers out of my group, um, very independently. But she lets me be a part of it too sometimes. And then um, my students, Jenna Lind, Eric, Anna Christina, um, Azale, and Christina, who um, four of them are working on bacterial related projects, and then Anna Christina is our virologist right now. Um, and then um, I also wanted to thank, uh, well, really all the staff, but particularly Andy Witherell, Brooke Weber, Rick Hafner, and Keith Heinzen, who are in our seed potato program, because they also help a lot um, when we want samples collected in a certain way. They help us rate field plots and things like that. Um, so. so I wanted to start out talking actually about the seed program and then to introduce the pathogen. It's that group that I'm going to be describing today and to show you um, how it, why we're interested in it. Um, is this? I don't even know. It is not. Okay. So I, I'm located in Madison. Um, most of our commercial potatoes are grown in the central sands right here. Um, and then our seed growers are up in Anago here, and then the university farm is up in Rhinelander. There's a highway that just runs straight up and down, so I spent a lot of my time driving up and down that road. Um, and things basically, uh, like everything, they run downhill, I guess. So the potato, seed potatoes grown in Rhinelander are sold to Anago. Those are generally sold everywhere south. Um, and the other key thing that's going on in Wisconsin is the Potato Germplasm Center is here at Sturgeon Bay. So um, the U.S. collection of diverse potato genotypes is easily accessible right there. Um, and then this is the farm. Um, it's about 1,000 acres, so it's actually larger than the Madison campus. It's mostly woods and a couple of lakes. We have four greenhouses, about 100 acres, 90 acres of potatoes every year, and it's a three-year rotation, and we tend to irrigate out of this lake here. Um, and it's, it's a really beautiful place to visit. There's a lot of wildlife. Um, I've been followed by wolves. We see bears. Um, and so I stole all those pictures from National Geographic, and they didn't have the really important wildlife that we have <laughs> up at the farm. They didn't have any photos of these guys. But um, when I first started, I was interested, I was trained as a bacteriologist in Allen's lab, and so I wanted to work on bacteria because that's what I knew how to do. And I knew we had Pectobacterium or soft rot erwinia in the lake and we were irrigating with it. It seemed like that could be a problem. Um, and then sending these potatoes all over the country. Okay, so how are they produced and was there actually a problem when you irrigate with water containing a plant pathogen? So everything comes up to that farm and tissue culture. Um, we sent tens of thousands of these little plants up there every year from a the lab. These should be pathogen free. They get put into a hydroponic system and we grow about three to 400,000 mini tubers this way every year. These little guys are planted in the field and what we harvest from them is sold to the farmers to support the program or we replant it and sell the second generation. And if all goes well, then they have warehouses full of seed potatoes. And actually in the seed system, soft rot's not that big of a deal. And I think it's because they don't stress the plants for size and they store them at a cooler temperature. So we see it, but we don't see it as a big deal. In commercial farming, though, it is a big problem, and it tends to either be a problem right as they're emerging, if we have violent storms, which happen a lot in Wisconsin, or at this stage, when the whole warehouse will just rot. Um, so, so it is a significant issue, but not generally with the growers I work with. We also certify um, all the seed potatoes from a regulatory program that works out to about seven and a half percent of the total uh, potatoes produced in the U.S. And I wanted to show you a little bit of this. So I, I realized just a few years ago what an amazing, we never throw anything away. So we have this amazing <coughs> data set that goes back decades. Um, plus we have a lot of information on what it actually costs to produce a crop of potatoes and what the diseases actually cost because we've been keeping these budgets for years and we're throwing them away. So we started publishing that, um, and again, I can go back to these reports and see whether soft rot's a big deal or not. And on occasion, it shows up. It's not really the biggest thing we worry about. We got some kind of fun graphs out of this. So for example, we can track reduction in disease over the past 60 years. 
and reduction in human error over the past 60 years in farming. So disease goes down with a half-life of about 10 years, and farming, the half-life is about the same as a generation of farmers, right? So it's about 26 years. Um, and from this data set, that we, from our certification data, it's just the form that they have to fill out for seed lot, we can tell that PBY right now is the number one reason, so potato virus Y is the number one reason for um, seed certification uh, rejections. And that's the basis for why I'm really here today, because of this project with Stuart, and why I might be becoming a, be becoming a virologist. Um, this really struck me, until we put this graph together, I hadn't realized this, that the other main reason for rejections are mistakes that the farmers make. Um, and it's actually a bigger issue than disease. And really, some of these PBY rejections are probably due to farmers making mistakes, too. So I have become, I understand more now why maybe social sciences need to be a part of what we do, because we should be thinking about how farmers make decisions when we also try to control disease or get them to adopt control methods. Um, so. Okay. The other place where we see a lot of things coming out of the field besides the seed production is, again, Ruth Ginger's uh, program on organic potato production. So she works with now 38 farmers between Ohio and North Dakota, and we run variety trialing, and it's, it's all very applied. So uh, what varieties would work best for them? How can we get them seed? How should they be controlling disease? How do you grow potatoes without irrigation? That kind of thing. And we, we get a lot of disease incidence data. Soft rot, so what this table shows, it's all these tiny little numbers, it's a whole bunch of varieties, and then it's what percent of the lots from 2013 did we have uh, a lot of culls off that field due to a certain disease. So, for example, Adirondack blue, silver skirt was our main problem in most of our lots from the farms we got data from. So soft rot is never a big deal, but it's constantly there. So at harvest, it's not a big deal, but when you try to store things, it can become a big deal. So the Pectobacteria, bacterial soft rot, what is this? It's, um, they're gram-negative bacteria. They're the Enterobacteriaceae family, so that's the same as E. coli and Salmonella. So you can think of them sort of like a plant pathogenic E. coli. They're really easy to work with, and a lot of the tools that work with E. coli will also work with Pectobacteria. We used to call it Erwinia keratopera, the soft rot Erwinia. So this family has a lot of human and plant pathogens. They often have insect vectors. They're really common in the environment. They're easy to, the family tends to be very easy to get out of water and soil, for example, and off of plants and off of people and cows. And they have simple, circular, five megabase genomes, and they sometimes have plasmids. The, the soft rot bacteria that we work with, plasmids don't seem to be an important part of the story. They just have this five megabase circle in their genome. And we've been grouping them we call it the PDD clade, so it's Pectobacteria, Dickia, and Brunaria. So these three genera seem to fall, form a, a group of plant pathogens, the Naturobacteria you see. Um, Pectobacteria and Dickia are broad host range soft rot pathogens, so they cause decay and wilt type diseases in, in a whole, you know, whole bunch of different species of dicots and, and monocots. And then Brunaria has been almost unstudied. So we think of it, it infects things like willow trees and uh, walnut trees, and then recently cantaloupe has been found to be a host. Um, and we don't tend to think of it as peptolytic or causing soft drop, but we really don't know very much about this genus at all. Um, okay, so this is a typical example of a potato that has soft rot um, from the field, and you can see this spot right here, that's would have been what was connected to the stolen or the stem that connects the tuber to the plant. And that seems to be where the bacteria, we often see evidence that they've gone in through the stolen and into the tuber. And I also just want you to think about, this is a really nice anaerobic chamber, right? So they've gone in, they can't digest the skin, right? They're, so they've got their own little protective food source in the soil that they're not sharing with anybody. Um, so you get very high concentrations of bacteria here. So I wanted to emphasize that these are broad host range necrotrophs, and so I, I'm guessing there's a lot of people here in this audience and a lot about Pseudomonas syringae, so please don't try to make this fit the Pseudomonas syringae model. Um, <laughs> we get this a lot when we try to submit papers. Um, so they, 
We don't have examples of gene for gene resistance, for example, that we know of at least. Um, we don't have evidence that these pathogens are suppressing plant defenses. In fact, they seem to perhaps induce cell death and, and benefit from that. Um, and they do cause cell death. Um, so it's very different from Pseudomonas syringi, which there's lots of examples of gene for gene resistance. They are very active in suppressing plant defenses. And they do cause cell death eventually, but that's not what happens first. Um, I also wanted to point out this symptom, because it's one that I hadn't really appreciated until I started working with this. The first thing that these guys do is turn the plant yellow like that. So you can see that in the field as like a bright yellow spot. And then the plant dies. Okay. So where are they in the plant? They seem to be very good at colonizing the vascular system, specifically the xylem. So this is just a potato stem that's been inoculated with GFP-labeled bacteria. And I'll show you in a second why we think those are xylem. And you can see this in field samples too. The xylem will turn black, um, and the center part of the stem will also turn black. And then the bacteria are in between the cells too. So um, that, this is a stem cut uh, more longitudinally, and here's the bacteria in the xylem. You can see the um, kind of spring-like structure of the xylem. And what, what strikes me with this is the high density of the bacterial cells, so really packed in there. And that they actually, the structure of the xylem is still intact. That surprised me too, because I thought of a soft rot pathogen that would break down the xylem, but it's not doing that here. Um, and then this is the, uh, the cells within the stem, and hopefully what you can see is that the bacteria tend to be around the edges of the cells. They're not just necessarily um, collapsing everything right away. Um, they do occasionally get inside a cell, and you'll see them swimming around like crazy in these cells. So that's another difference between Pseudomonas syringi and, and uh, which you guys are probably more familiar with, the Pectobacterium. These guys tend to be modal in the plant. They cut their flagella and they're swimming. It makes uh, doing growth curves a challenge because the bacteria don't stay at all where you put them. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is the density inside the cell is never like it gets into the, the xylem. So you can see the big difference here between how much GMP is there and what's inside the cell. All right, so just a little bit about what we know, how these guys interact with plants at a, a more a larger level. When I started in Madison, um, I had to switch topics, and I had to work with something on potato, and I had an empty lab. And so the first thing I did was run out um, with Walt Stevenson, and we visited a bunch of fields and storages where they had soft drought diseases. The entire time he was trying to talk me into working on common scab, but that just seemed too hard. <laughs> so collected a bunch of strains, and I was just trying to get a collection to start working with, and the first surprise we got is that what we were finding out in the field wasn't just Pectobacterium keratoavrum or Pectobacterium antrocepticum, which were the species we'd expected to find, but we found a lot of other clades of Pectobacterium also causing disease. So these are examples of what we commonly find, so it's Pectobacterium keratoavrum, keratoavrum, or subspecies Brazilians, or subspecies Odiferum, or Pectobacterium wasabii, which until then we had thought was a pathogen of wasabi and not potato. We haven't found Pectobacterium antrocepticum yet in Wisconsin. I think it's because our summers are so hot, but it doesn't survive. Um, but the take home point here is that multiple species tend to be present in a field and sometimes in a plant. And so what we've done then in our lab group is we're trying to focus less on the things that differ between the species and more on what does that genus have in common since we're going to find multiple species within a field anyway. Um, okay, so this is just a representation of a phylogenetic tree, and that's to remind me to tell you that I, I work very closely with a couple of researchers at UW campus, and one of them is Nicole Perna, who's um, a bio we're interested in bioinformatics and in the evolution of this bacterial family. And Alan is the one who introduced us, and it's been, so thank you. Um, we've been working together. We both started at the UW at about the same time. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to tell you about today is from this collaboration. So one of the things Nicole did was she sequenced a big chunk of our culture collection. Um, she had money from biofuels uh, money. And I'm not sure you can defend the choice of sequencing soft rot bacteria for biofuels research, but I was happy she did it. And 
All of these genome sequences went into her database, so this is publicly available. Um, and each, each um, gene and each microbe has its own page. And you can get the sequence, the protein sequence, the map, where that gene is. This is HerbL, which is a regulator for the type 3 secretion system. And then everything we know about that gene that people have bothered to put in. So um, motifs, uh, publications related to that gene, and all the other homologs within the database you can quickly link to. So this has been really valuable for us. And I wanted to show you a few things um, that we've been doing with this. And this, this is where this 300 genome title came from. So we've been using doing an analysis of 307 of the genomes that are in here and annotated. So some of the things that we've been able to do, um, this is my favorite project out of this. Uh, we had a student, Bing, um, who developed a supervised machine learning program to tell us what genes were likely to be involved in plant microbe interactions. So we've got a lot of genes with no known function and no clear way to figure out what the function is. So she basically took all the data in this database and, and um, used it as a training set. And so I, at the beginning of this project, didn't really know how do you describe what supervised machine learning is. And the way they described it to us, is it's, uh, to my lab group, was it's like Netflix, right? Netflix will learn what you like and make suggestions on what other movie you might like. And that's basically what this program does. It learns from the training set what a gene involved in plant microbe interactions looks like, and then it suggests other genes, and it will rank them. Um, so we made a training set with Dikia denantia and then tried it with effective bacteria. And, uh, and here's Nicole and Jeremy working on this uh, related project. But um, so uh, to me, it's sort of a, a program that replaces the lab PI, right? because now we've got a ranked list of things that students should be working on. I don't need to tell the students anymore what genes to focus on. Um, and so this is what one of my students is now doing, is trying to figure out if the program actually worked. So he's using the ranked list and trying to see if he can detect that these genes are involved in plant microbe interactions. And we're looking at all the ones with no known function, and then he's just taking a random list and seeing if the machine is doing any better than just choosing them randomly. Anyway, while we were working on this stuff, we noticed that these sorts of papers were coming out. So this is from a group in Finland, and they reported a Pectobacterium wasabi sequence, and they reported the sequence of, of their strain, but then they also included the ones out of our collection, because we'd never bothered publishing anything on it. And so this was in 2012, and I, I called up the call and said, you know, maybe we should start publishing something on our genome sequences. They've been sitting out there for a while, and nobody's doing anything. And you know how things are. We didn't have a student to work on this project. We were both busy with other things. So a year later, she sends me this email, which is all you're supposed to see here is that it's really, really long. But this is the key click, part of this email. It says, I have some data for you to mull over in your spare time. And my hope is that you will look at these and have immediate and profound insights into key evolutionary innovations in this clade. Um, she was, of course, joking there. <laughs> And then here was the key part. You might want to stop reading now. And so that's what I did. And I put this away for two months because it was so long. And the file that she sent was so complicated, I just could not deal with it. But then we had a really, really cold winter in Wisconsin. There wasn't much that anybody could do. So I, I finally opened it up again in January. And she had sent this Excel file that had all these extensive comparisons between 307 genomes. And she wanted to know, could we make a story out of this? And so I spent the next six months looking at this, trying to figure out what did it mean. Um, and so what would you do with this kind of comparison? So my, my background, again, it's more mutating genes and looking at the biology of things and not in bioinformatics. So was, I felt like I was a first year grad student trying to figure this out. And I use this, this mural here as inspiration a lot for what we do in the lab. So is there, is there, are there any Madison people that do you guys recognize this? Um, this is the Mifflin Street Co-op, the old co-op, and this is a mural that's painted of the idealized food system that they were trying to create. Um, and uh, it's, it's an example of where you would find enterobacteria in the environment too, right? It's everywhere. It's in the water and the soil and the, the plants we eat and the people. Okay, so we've got genomes from this environment, and what, what can we learn from that? So we decided to focus on two questions. Um, 
because we only wanted to write one paper <laughs> the rate we were going. Um, and Nicole's main interest is this, this clade of bacteria that includes the soft rot bacteria and the Brunaria. Where, where do they come from? What is their common ancestor? So we think they were either related to the common, they had Yersinia as, a, as the next closest relative or E. coli and Salmonella. And so could we figure that out? We've, she's been trying to do this for the last 15 years without a, a clear answer. With all of these genomes, can we find the right set of genes to give us that answer? And then I was interested in, well, both of us were interested in, can we identify genes that were important, that were acquired by this common ancestor that helped this clade become plant pathogens or become the type of plant pathogen that they are? So, and what would those genes look like? Who are they? Okay, so I don't have a good figure for this tree. This question that Nicole had is, is it derived from a common ancestor that's similar to your similarity, coli and salmonella, because we don't have the answer yet. It turns out two-thirds of the genes support one answer and one-third support a different answer, and she can't figure out how to do the statistics to decide if any of those signals are correct. So she's working right now with a statistician to try to answer what seems like a simple question. But we were at least able to get a good um, idea of how the, the strains within the clade were, this group were related. So then we, we try to go after this question instead. So what genes are more common in this group of bacteria than in other enterobacteria? And that's a big piece of what's in this Excel file. And then we wanted to see, okay, if we get this class of genes, does it match any of the other data sets we have? So do they tend to be regulated by quorum sensing? Do they tend to be expressed in plants? Do they tend to be things that this machine learning program picked up? So we can take this set and, and put it against all these other uh, sets of data that we have. So one of the first things that surprised me, or I thought was interesting, is that the genes that we identified as more commonly found in this group of plant pathogens and other enterobacteria tended to be near tRNAs, and they didn't tend to be linked to really obvious mobile elements. Um, so we didn't, it's not completely true, but that's, that was one thing that really stood out. Okay, so I, you know, if I was teaching a class, I'd divide you into groups of five right now and ask you to write a list of um, genes that, that are probably more common in this group of plant pathogens and in, than related animal pathogens or environmental bacteria. And, and here's some symptom pictures I've shown you. So what do you think we would find? Yeah, plant cell wall degrading enzymes, yeah. So that, that was definitely in the set. So that's the first thing. I wanted to show you. So this, this felt good. I was, we, we should have found the plant cell wall degrading enzymes that are responsible for the <coughs> symptoms we see with this group of pathogens, and that was what got uh, spit out by the, the database. Um, it was really helpful, though, to see this complete list from the, the 20 plant pathogen genomes we were looking at and then comparing it to the 280-some other genomes because it helped us figure out what the loci are and get some idea of how these may have been acquired. So for example, there's 21 loci encoding plant cell wall degrading enzymes in both Pladicchia and Ecobacterium, and there's six in Brunaria. I was surprised to see so many plant cell wall degrading enzymes in these genomes that I hadn't been thinking of as, as pectolytic. Of these six, there's one that's widely present in the Enterobacteria ACA. So it's in Yersinia and E. coli as well. And it's got PELW and this uh, pectin methylesterase here, and then a, an uptake system. So, okay, and the, the other thing that I thought was really interesting are these six conserved loci that are in these three genera, they're really diverse. So there's a peptate lyse, there's two cellulases, there's a polyglactronase, a pectinocell esterase, and I think this might possibly be involved in, in plant cell wall degrading activities too, but nobody's looked at it. It's a phenolic acid decarboxylase. And this is just one of these examples. I, we, we've been struggling as we've been trying to write this up. How do we not have a, you know, 50 figures in this paper? What are the, the key things? And so I found that as a struggle when I was trying to describe this too. But this is a typical example of what one of these loci would look like. Brunaria will have one of the genes, and then one or the other of these other two genera will have several other plant cell wall degrading enzymes of different classes stuck into that locus. In this case, for example, in Dickia, there's three pectate lyases, this conserved KY, and then a pectin, oh, yeah, 
like being with that one is right now. And all the subsequent acquisitions beyond these six um, loci tend to be enzymes that are still within those same six classes with a few exceptions. And we don't see like enzyme types that are in one indicia but not peptobacteria. We seem to have the same types of activities, although not necessarily the same enzymes. We're still left with the question people have been asking for a long time. What's the benefit of having all these loci developed, dedicated to the um, plant cell wall degrading enzymes? I wonder if it's analogous to the story that we see with the effectors in the type 3 secretion system, if um, the plants are defending against these enzymes, for example. We do know if plants can make inhibitors that affect these enzymes, and that cell wall composition differs among plant species. So maybe they do need to keep acquiring enzymes to uh, maintain a broad host range. To get back to that, but okay. Um, I wanted to just touch on, on this. This is a something um, we published one paper in this area. We're still working a little bit on this. So when we do these analyses, some sets of genes just keep popping to the top of the list all the time. And one of them is the um, this fermentation pathway that ends in either acetone or butanediol. Um, and so every analysis we did, this came up right at the top as something interesting. So we finally looked at it more carefully. And this, this will tie back to the, the pectate uh, biases in a second. So it's, it's a very small gene cluster that's got a regulatory gene and then three enzymes that take, um, it's the mixed acid fermentation pathway. So it starts with pyruvate and then goes to either one of these two um, endpoints depending on whether that gene's present or not. This isn't in, in all of the strains. And if you've taken an intro micro course, you've probably played with this reaction. It's um, what the vogue prosker reaction detects, and it's a way that we tell if coliform bacteria, like E. coli and salmonella, are present in water samples, for example, versus enterobacteria that we don't have to worry about that are plant pathogens. It's because this pathway is present in a lot of the environmental ones, like peptobacteria, but absent from the human pathogens. But it turns out these compounds are really interesting. I think they've been kind of ignored um, by a lot of us. So they can act, they're volatiles that act as insect pheromones. They can inhibit the ethylene response in plants. And they are pretty alkaline, so they raise the pH. And that comes back to soft wrap pathogenicity. Because under anaerobic conditions, this pathway is really odd, and the, the potato becomes more, or the environment becomes more alkaline and the plant cell wall degrading enzymes are really only active at pH 8. So it's a way for the, if the bacterium didn't have this pathway, those enzymes would be no good, right? Couldn't, they couldn't use them. All this shows is a, this is just a pH. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.